What's up, guys? I am back. It's Paul, and this is Pauline Theology. So I have been doing some studying for a paper that I had to write for my Old Testament class. What we've been going through this whole semester has been the wisdom books, uh, the poetry, and um, prophets, and minor prophets. And we're going through the 12 right now. And if you've never heard the word the 12, that is basically the minor prophets in a Christian view standpoint. So uh, I had an assignment to write on one of these books and tell what the entire book was about in one sentence. So as you can see, that would be quite difficult if I did long books, but I decided to do it on Obadiah. Now, before I did it on Obadiah, I did not realize that it is actually the shortest book in the Old Testament. So I didn't do it because it was the shortest book. I had another reason. I thought that that famous verse uh, that so many people talk about, he says, uh, Esau, I hated Jacob I loved. I thought that was in this book, and so I picked that book, and when I pick something, I just stick with it. But I found out it wasn't in there when I read it, and I was like, wow. I guess uh, I'll just do it anyway. Well, I'm glad I did because I have learned quite a bit. The little book this is, it's a mere 21 verses. The little book that it is packs so much theological punch. There is so much that we can get out in it. I've read a couple commentaries on it to understand just a little bit better what it contains and what its meaning is for the people it was written to and how we can think about it today as we live our lives. And so that's, that's what I'm going to discuss with you guys. So I'm going to start out telling you the author. Obviously, the, 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 the book is called Obadiah, and the first verse is the vision of Obadiah from the Lord. So um, Obadiah is pretty much it. When was it written? Uh, I think it's written later than. Nobody knows quite when it was written. Uh, because there's not really so much detail in there, but we know that it was written after the exile to uh, Babylon because in it we see that Edom, who God is judging, uh, that is the country that was actually related to Esau. That's why I said Esau, he hated and Jacob he loved. But anyway, we find out that this happens after the fall of Jerusalem because Edom, the Edomites, actually start to pillage and spoil uh, take spoils from the land of or the city of Jerusalem after they had been carted off. That is, the Israelites had been carted off. So we have kind of a time frame after that. It's probably going to be later on after that, but uh, let's get into it. So what did I learn from reading this book? Well, what I learned was, uh, I guess I can give you a couple numbers. I would say that I learned one main thing from two things. So one, that God is sovereign over all things. That's basically this book, basically the entire Bible, actually, to tell you the truth. But that God is sovereign over everybody. Everybody. God is sovereign over everybody. And he shows this by restoring Jerusalem or the people of Israel to their homeland and by judging or uh, bringing about justice on Edom. So the book or Obadiah and his oracle, God speaking through Obadiah, talks to Edom and says that you will be judged. Now, I think that God really cares for everybody. And I think that's an important aspect that we have to realize is that God cares not just for the people of Israel. So in the Old Testament, a lot of times we think, well, that God only loved the Israelites and that everybody else was just their own thing. And now since the Israelites forsaked God, that uh, now all of the other nations can be a part of this beauty and wonder of Christ and the part of God's family. Well, I don't think that's actually true. I believe that it was always a part of God's plan to allow us to be a uh, people unto himself. And for a little bit, you can say that because in Deuteronomy, when God calls his people out and he says, I have chosen you not because you were better than everybody, but because I loved you and I made a promise to your father Abraham. He says, the reason I did this is to make you a nation 
of priests in order that you uh, would be a nation of priests. So what does priests do? They intercede for people. And so God called them out of all of the nations of the earth so that that person or that people group could intercede for all of the other nations. Now, that's how I know that it is wonderful and awesome that we would be able to take part in this beautiful reconciliation of the whole world because God loved us and he gave us some people that'll help us. So let's get back to uh, Obadiah. Now, God cares about what we do. See, God speaks directly to Edom. Now, it says concerning probably in most of your English translations, but uh, I can't go into the specifics, but the use in the Hebrew language of this word is actually better translated to Edom. So he says that this oracle or this vision or this prophecy is to Edom. So if you understand it in the context that that uh, uh, Obadiah is speaking to Edom, because the people that had ransacked Jerusalem were probably around in that near country. They were probably just hanging out, trying to do uh, uh, all of the evil or pillaging of that place, taking all their stuff. And so when uh, Obadiah is speaking these prophecies out or writing these prophecies down and passing them out, then uh, the Edomites surely being around that area would have come across this information. And because so, we can know that God was speaking to them as well. And if he is speaking to them about their actions, if he is speaking to them about what he hates, about their actions they're doing and the motivations they have behind it, then we know that he cares about the Edomites. Because if he didn't, he would just let them do whatever they want to do, man, and they would destroy themselves. But instead, he comes to them and says, you, Edom, are haughty, built up, thinking that you are, are, are the greatest of all. I think it says that you soar like eagles up, up in the clouds or you are on the top of the mountains in the crevice. But, but Jesus, but God, excuse me, Jesus, but God through Obadiah says these words. He says that uh, uh, you will be brought down low and you will be made shameful for all the nations. So because they thought they were so awesome, so great and so mighty, God said, I'm going to humble you. I'm going to humble you. Now you're like, well, why would God just say that uh, he's going to humble them just because they're proud? Well, when you continue on, you find out that it's just a little bit more than that haughtiness. It's actually because Edom and Israel have a long, long history. So Edom, I said earlier in this video that they are the descendants of a man named Esau. And Israel are the descendants of Israel, which his name was formerly Jacob. Now, Israel and Jacob are brothers. You see, a very long time ago, Jacob stole, or maybe the right word would be deceived and tricked his father into giving him Esau's inheritance. Now, technically, Esau sold his inheritance, sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. I don't know if it was soup, porridge, whatever it was, but it must have been darn good for him to sell his part in uh, his, his father's inheritance. I mean, he must have been real hungry. He must have been something. But ever since then, there has been a rift between these two. But the thing is, Obadiah pulls this out. Whenever Edom, or I'm sorry, whenever Israel falls and Jerusalem is ransacked and taken over, the Edomites go in there and pillage it too. They take their land. They laugh at them, scoff, and take their stuff. You see, when Jerusalem was getting attacked and the people of Israel were being uh, uh, killed and hurt and taken off to another land, the Edomites just stood by. Edom just stood and watched. Now, Scripture says in that, it says that you stood by and watched. And when he says that, he says Esau stood by and watched. He says, your brother Jacob. So the, the writer Obadiah 
through in speaking God through Obadiah is calling these countries out, calling Edom out specifically saying, how could you do this to your brother, to your family? You see, the real root of this righteous anger that God has on Edom is because he is supposed to take care of his brother. You see, because God is sovereign, that means he cares about all the nations. And an important aspect of all of us, as a people, we should be looking after one another. That's an application, is that in this scripture we can see that we are supposed to be looking after one another. We can see this resemblance in Genesis when God speaks to Cain and he says, where is your brother Abel? And this is right after he had killed him and took off. He says, where is your brother Abel? And Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? In the same way, Obadiah is calling or retelling that back saying, you stood by and watched as Jacob was taken over. That is where the judgment comes in from the pride that they have laughing at their brother because they were well, but their brothers were broken and beaten down and taken into exile. So God judged them. He said, your hearts aren't right that you would do something to your own brother like that. John, in 1 John, says that, how can you say that you love me when you see your brother every day and treat him? the way you treat him. You hate your brother. Wow. Man, that's got to speak something to us. But let's continue on. I said that the sovereignty of God is displayed. And how is it displayed? First, the judgment which happens on Esau or Edomites happens on the Edomites. Next, we see his sovereignty in the restoration of his people. See, it says that when God pours this destruction or this, uh, uh, this cup of, of wrath upon Edom. And Edom is actually a representative of all the nations because quickly after that it says Edom and the nations. So uh, I don't want to go into a whole lot of that, but oftentimes in prophecies in Ezekiel and in um, Jeremiah and in Amos, it talks about Edom, but then it extrapolates, not just Edom, it doesn't focus in, it zooms back out and begins to speak about all the nations that have oppressed Israel. And when you oppress Israel, that means you're oppressing God because that is God's people. It's like whenever uh, a kid is bullying another kid and the mom finds out. You know, you're not just bullying that kid anymore. You're actually bullying that mom because she's going to be very, very angry when she finds out about that. In the same way, it's when we attack or, or when Edom attacked or when all the nations attack Israel, they're attacking God because they are God's people. They are God's children. So we find that uh, God demonstrates this sovereignty over all the nations, not only by his punishment of them, but also his restoration, his ability to weave other nations or, or weave other peoples to destroy and take down the nations that are oppressing Israel and then calling them out of that, uh, uh, that exile or calling them out of that uh, trouble and restoring them to their land. So God in this scripture speaking through Obadiah was telling Esau, telling the Edomites that they were going to be overthrown by the very people that they trusted, the allies that they trusted. See, God can use everything around us in order for us to gain what he wants us to gain or have what he wants us to have to bless us. He can use anything by any means because he controls all things by the power of his will. That's what it talks about in uh, Ephesians, that he has controlled everything or holds everything by the power of his will. And so God, by the power of his will through these nations, his sovereign power through these nations is going to restore Israel. Now, this restoration is still contingent. You see, whenever uh, uh, they are going to be restored, it's because they come to a realization that the only way they can be restored is through God, through Yahweh, 
through Adonai Yahweh, the Lord God, is the only way that they can be restored to this place. Now, let me tell you how I know this, because in the scripture, it says that those on, I'm sorry, it says that escape is for those on Zion. Now, Zion is very important. Now, this is called Zionism in a lot of places because they believe that the place, Zion, is where untouchableness, like it, it can't be, it can't be uh, uh, defeated or it can never be broken because if it does, it means God has lost his power. But we understand deeper in Obadiah that that, that thought that Zion can't be destroyed was ruined. Because what did I say earlier? That Edom ransacked and stole and pillaged the desolate land of Jerusalem, Zion. They destroyed that place. They ransacked it and stole everything out of it. So if the, the author Obadiah is prophesying that that hope or escape or salvation is going to be at Zion, it cannot be because that city is anything special. Because God left that city a long time ago. So if these people uh, of Israel believe that they can be saved, it is only by Obadiah speaking about the presence of God, Adonai Yahweh, returning to Zion. It's not that Zion as a city, they can be saved, but it's because of the presence of God, the presence of the Lord, just that manifest awe and majesty has come and saved them. That's where they'll find salvation. And when it says that, it says this place will be holy again. So the presence of God has returned and made a way in which it will separate evil from this place. A place that had been desolated and destroyed, a place that had been profaned and broken down will now be holy once again because God has returned. His presence has returned and he has made every Thing right. See, right after those verses, I believe that's uh, verse 15, it continues on and talks about how, uh, how the Israelites will regain this possession of this land, this possession of this land, this possession of this land, this possession of this land. But the focus is not on those. It is on the last verse, verse 21. At the very end, it says, and God will be reigning over his kingdom. So it'll be the kingdom of God. You see, that connects, that, that verse uh, 17 is connecting to that verse 21. It is saying that those who are saved by Zion, it says that, that salvation found in Zion, it says that God will reign on this mountain. And before, it talks about how uh, Edom, it says saviors will, 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 will rise to the top of that mountain and they will rule um, Edom, the mountain of Edom, because God will reign. And so it's like a, a flipping from, from um, Edom pillaging and destroying Israel to Israel ruling over Edom. But this rule is different because Zion, or I'm sorry, because the Lord Yahweh is the one who is the king. So even in a hateful or, or um, disdain uh, rulership that Edom showed, to the Israelites, a beautiful and wonderful and holy, loving rulership where all things are made right will be what Israel, the people of God, will do as they reign because they are reigning under the authority and power of God. Man, that's that's a powerful book. I hope that uh, you read it. It's only 21 verses. So check it out, man. Uh, see what you got. If you have any questions, then write some in the comments, man. It's, it's cool how much I'm learning being able to just study his word and being able to go to the library, grab books and read. Man, I'm having a great time at seminary. I'm learning so much and I'm going to make more videos here soon because I'm about to go on break and I'll have many, many, many hours just to read, 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 read. So uh, check out for that content. Again, I pray that you guys will just love Jesus, that you would uh, let him stir your hearts 
to repentance and more knowledge of Him, and that you would get to know and love and live out the gospel in your life. Thanks for watching, guys.